Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful new day in which to worship you. We invite you to be present here among us. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon this place, open our hearts and our minds to you and to your word, uh, that we might allow you to come into our hearts, to transform us into the people that you would have us to be, that we might be your people here on the earth. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are, uh, second Sunday of Lent, and we are continuing our journey with Jesus uh, as He makes His way uh, to Jerusalem, uh, and we are meeting uh, some people along the way uh, and uh, kind of looking at their interactions with Jesus. Uh, today, we are in Mark Chapter 10, starting at verse 17. And there it tells us that as Jesus was setting out on a journey, and I think it's the New Living Translation actually says, as he was beginning his journey toward Jerusalem, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, I've always thought this was kind of a weird way to begin this conversation. I mean, the man comes up and calls him good teacher, which doesn't seem all that unusual or inappropriate. However, this word good is, is like many words in the English language, uh, that is somewhat nondescript. I mean, what do you mean when you say good? I mean, many people in our culture today would probably say of themselves, well, I'm a good person, but what does that really mean, I'm a good person? Well, actually, this particular word that this young man uses for Jesus uh, is agathos in the, in the Greek, uh, and it really means perfect or complete in regard to morality, to be morally exceptional. Now, that's a little different. I'm not sure how many of us would say that we were morally exceptional. Okay, perhaps, Better than some other people we know, perhaps, but morally exceptional. And so that is why Jesus responds with, why do you call me agathos? Why do you call me exceptional? Only God is morally exceptional. And I think that's part of the question is, you see, Jesus is God. But he's kind of questioning this young man. Are you saying this because you recognize who I really am? Or are you just buttering me up? But Jesus doesn't even wait for any response as he continues on. You know the commandments. Now, for Jews, they would have been very familiar. They, they were the people to whom God had given the law. And the basis of the law was the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus said, you, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, or we're more familiar with covet. Honor your father and mother. Now, it's interesting. He chooses those six. He skips right over the first four, which have to do with our relationship with God. You shall have no other God before me. You shall make no idols. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. 
You shall keep the Sabbath day. He skips right over those four and just talks about the six that have to do with our relationships with one another. And the young man says, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And I think we read right over that. Jesus is having this conversation. He looks at this young man who says, yeah, I've kept all of those commandments. And he looks into his eyes and it says, and he loved him. And it kind of reminds me of an old southern saying, bless his heart. Which if you know people from the south, can mean a vast array of things, including you're kind of an idiot. And I, I kind of wonder if that isn't part of what he's, he's thinking. If you, if you look at those, with the exception of honor your father and mother, which actually is, is number five in the list, and for whatever reason, Jesus saves it to the end of his list, but honor your father and mother, that really is the only one that requires any relational interaction. I mean, if you think about it, you can you cannot murder, you cannot commit adultery, you cannot steal, you cannot bear false witness, you cannot defraud all without actually having any interaction with another human being. And, and so on some levels, I could become a hermit and keep the law because I wouldn't have any opportunity to do any of those things. But what this young man and what I think many people fail to understand is that is the letter of the law. It isn't really the spirit of the law. Because Jesus, in another section, is asked, what is the greatest commandment? What, what is the, the most important thing for us to do? And Jesus says, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But he says there's a second one that is just as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on to say that all, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two, which seems to suggest that the whole Old Testament can be summed up in loving God and loving your neighbor. And so the law, these thou shalt nots, really aren't so much about the thou shalt nots, but are more about what you ought to do is love each other. And so he looks at this young man and he loves him. But he says, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, 
for he had many possessions. Now, it's interesting, we, we always assume, and actually I tend to think that we are right in the assumption that, that, this, that he goes away and doesn't do what Jesus asks him to do. But it's interesting to know that Jesus tells him to go. Go, go home. Look at all of your stuff. Have a yard sale. Sell it all. Take the money that you make on all of your stuff and then give it to people who, who need it. So perhaps he was going to do that. But because he had so much stuff, it was hard. And it grieved him. I've got to give up all of this stuff. Now, we never hear about him later. So the assumption is that's not what he does, that he just goes home and enjoys his stuff. But what is Jesus' point? His point is, yes, you, you've kept the letter of the law, but you've completely missed the point of the law. You have incredible resources. You have a lot of stuff. But your stuff is more important to you than I am. Your stuff is more important to you than, than your neighbors. You've got all of this stuff. But on your way here, you probably passed numbers of people who could use a little help. But you did nothing. You see, Isaiah got it. Isaiah, in our passage that Gene read for us, is speaking on God's behalf. He is speaking the word of the Lord. And he says, you people think that you love me. You, you people do all of the right things. You say the right stuff. You fast. But in your fasting, you just get grumpy and take it out on your employees. You're not really fasting for any good reason. You're just fasting so that people know how, how spiritual you are. If you're going to fast, why don't you spend the money you're not spending on lunch and buy somebody else lunch? You see, you're, you're doing the right things, but you're missing the point. The point is, I want a relationship with you. I want you to love me. And in your love for me, I want you to love each other. Care for each other. Use your resources to support and encourage and help each other. So after this conversation with this man, Jesus then looks around and says to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. See, Jesus says things that ought to shock us. That, that, that ought to grab our attention. I mean, we, we looked last week at the fact that anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. That's a pretty serious statement. And here he says, how hard it will be for those who have well to enter the kingdom of God. 
Now, this was a shock to those that he was speaking to. It was a shock to his disciples because they believed and they had always been taught that wealth was a sign of God's blessing, that people were were wealthy because God loved them and had blessed them. And so their response to this is they were perplexed. And Jesus says to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I think we read over that, and I've actually I've heard people say and, and even preach that there was this gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle because it was so narrow that if you came with a camel loaded down with goods, you had to take everything off of the camel in order for the camel to fit through the eye of the needle. I have not actually seen any evidence that there ever was such a gate. I think it's really just a story that somebody came up with to make us feel better about what Jesus says here. Because I think what he's really saying is, it's easier for a camel, a large mammal, to go through the eye of a needle, and if you've ever tried to put thread through the eye of a needle, that's not even all that easy. When we were in England a few years ago, we were headed to Cornwall, and we were driving that big three-lane highway, or motorway. And my GPS said, make a left. Now, we're on the left-hand side because it's England. But there was no, there was no exit sign. In fact, there was no exit ramp. But as I looked, there was what literally looked like a driveway on my left. There was even a tree with its branches kind of over this little driveway, and that seemed to be where my GPS was telling me to go. So I turned, and sure enough, that's where my GPS wanted me to go. This was a lane, two-way traffic, my side mirrors were scraping the hedges on both sides. And the posted speed limit was 50. (laughs) But it occurs to me, this, I mean, in another place, Jesus says, take the narrow gate. For the way to destruction is wide and the road is easy. The interstate. But the road to life is narrow. And I was reminded of this little thing that most people would probably drive right by and never even notice that it was there. And I think that is Jesus' point. It it isn't easy. The road is narrow. So he tells them that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a person who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And it says, they were greatly astounded, and they said to one another, then who can be saved? We've always been told it's, it's the rich people who are blessed, who God loves, that's why they're rich. And if they can't get into heaven, who has a chance? And Jesus essentially says, exactly. That is exactly my point. Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, that would be you guys, me, 
everybody you have ever known? For mortals, it is impossible. For God, all things are possible. You see, it it isn't about what we have or don't have. It isn't about whether we are agathos, morally exceptional, because we're not. It's something God does for us. And Peter, who, you know, always has to get the last word, Peter said, wait, 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 wait. Look, we, we disciples, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel or the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. You'll be taken care of. Houses, brothers, sisters, relationships. But, and he just kind of slips this in there, with persecution and in the age to come eternal life which is where we started this whole conversation with the question how do I receive eternal life but many who are first will be last and those who are last will be first Jesus doesn't say easy things. He expects us to use the resources that he has given us, not just for ourselves, but to love one another. To be honest, we in this country have it very easy It's easy to be a Christian, to be a person of faith. Now, maybe it's not as easy now as it was 50 years ago, but compared to much of the world, it's really fairly easy. I mean, we have baptisms. Usually in the Presbyterian church, we bring our babies in, we sprinkle a little water on their heads, and we have a little party afterwards. But there are places in the world today, and this was true of the early church, there are places in the world today where when you make a decision to be baptized into the Christian faith, you are literally giving up everything that went before that moment. You're giving up family who will disown you for becoming a Christian. You're giving up your job, who will fire you for being a Christian. You're giving up many of your friends, who will not be friends with you anymore. So in the act of being baptized, being dunked under the water, dying with Christ, and rising again to a new life, that is serious business. They are literally losing everything that went before to start a whole new life in Christ. So for us, I mean, baptism is just a nice religious symbolic ceremony with cake after. It's easy. But are we, are we committed? Are we willing to actually listen to Jesus who says, go? Go, go, go examine your life. Go look at 
at your stuff and really think about what am I willing to give up to follow Jesus? What am I willing to do to follow Jesus? And then, having gone, having counted the cost, then come and follow me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you do love us. We give you thanks that you have created a way where there was no way. What is impossible for us is possible in you. But what does that mean? Help us, Lord, to understand what it means to follow you. what it means to commit our lives, what it means to love you with all of our soul, of our mind, of our body, of our strength. Help us, Lord, to go, to listen for your voice, to truly consider what we are willing to give and what is more important to us than you. And then help us to give that to you as well and come and follow. For Jesus' sake, Amen.